Thank you, Richard. If you you should have docked me for uh, how lengthy the inter or <laughs> the introduction was. Um, for those of you who wonder, the anthropology degree comes in handy, uh, and particularly in dealing with the primitive cultures that are or in the building that I work. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, my job's been made very easy, both by Neil's presentation and, and uh, uh, Jamie's this morning. Um, I, I'm going to go over kind of what we looked at. We just put out our, our um, we had our own Outlook conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. And at the same time, we put out our 10-year projections. So it allows me to kind of treat some of the short-term issues and the long-term issues as I go through these markets. Um, so I, I'll try to breeze through some of this because this stuff you've already seen at least once or twice already today. But the first is population growth and, and just uh, the only two things to point out here is one, Asia continues to be a very, very big part of the world. But you'll see that over the years where the growth really occurs is in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that has some implications for um, grain consumption as, we, as we'll see. Uh, the other big thing, and I think, uh, I can't remember if Jamie mentioned this or if, it, or if Paul did this morning, but uh, both urbanization and income growth and what that means for um, diets and, and moving into meat uh, uh, production or meat consumption. So you have countries like China, which are, um, okay, there we are, um, have been growing at double-digit growth, and we were ever. Uh, the panelists this morning talked about how that was going to slow, but still as uh, a huge engine insofar as world growth is concerned. But insofar as agricultural commodities are concerned, um, just what that has meant for uh, feed demand in particular, um, and even uh, in demand for uh, livestock products, which of course contribute feed demand somewhere else. And as we see that this, uh, you know, China is really one of the dominant uh, players, at least in at least in so far as the U.S. views the world uh, for a lot of the commodities that we produce and, and export. Um, you know, we just came off a year where we had record corn production, record wheat production, record rice production, record soybean production, uh, many other oil seeds at record levels. But I think of the thing that's really missed by a lot of people is we also had record consumption. And this chart shows sort of, um, at least for the major oil seeds and, and the major grains, how all of them pretty much, or most all of them, hit record levels this past year. Um, you would look at, at growth of rice. Rice has been essentially pretty much falls about population growth. Wheat a little bit more, uh, just because you do have some shifting of, of diets into wheat um, as, with income growth. But then look at feed grains, and in particular look at corn, where not only do we have biofuel production, but all, we also have feed uh, consumption, increasing feed consumption as livestock production gets more rationalized in, in a lot of these developing countries. And then soybeans, uh, where we've seen growth rates at over 4% for about the last 4% uh, annual growth um, uh, over the last 15 or so years, um, and which have just had tremendous effects on, on the world oil seed market. Um, these are our projections for the next 10 years. I, they parallel, I think, the, the chart that you just saw earlier, just in terms of, of again, we're looking at, at good um, increase in global trade for both uh, feed grains and also wheat. But then uh, soybeans, again, um, uh, both uh, these income growth in developing countries um, have an impact on both vegetable oil consumption and also uh, meat and poultry and dairy consumption, all of which feed into increased grain uh, consumption. Uh, the other big story, and I mentioned this last year, is the, f uh, the fact that after several years of dramatic growth in uh, corn use for ethanol in the U.S., um, that that has now begun to uh, flatten. Um, the, you, some of you are aware that the Environmental Protection Agency, the um, agency that's in charge of regulating the, um, uh, the, the so-called Energy Act of 2007, it has now reduced the mandates for corn going into ethanol production, largely because we are, we're at uh, um, uh, limits in terms of how much the domestic fuel supply can absorb more ethanol. And that what that's meant is that corn production has been essentially flat, or the corn use for ethanol has been essentially flat at around 125, 100, 
30 uh, million ton a year. Uh, that's expected to continue, however. That's not going to go away, uh, largely because corn still uh, remains to be uh, uh, priced uh, fairly attractively relative to uh, fossil fuels. Um, so let me go into some of the uh, individual commodities here. Uh, let me start by saying is that, again, despite these record production levels, uh, again, because we've had such strong consumption, you, you look around at grain stocks and they still are quite tight, I think, um, even though we've had improvements, obviously, particularly in corn uh, following the drought in 2012 in the U.S., uh, we had very large production in the U.S. We had very large production in South America, which I think Neil also mentioned, uh, uh, and, and uh, the Black Sea region. And because of that, we're seeing um, some rebound in, in uh, those stock levels. But again, relative to where we were, I mean, you think back at the price spikes uh, in 2007-8, we're certainly in better shape for wheat, but we're not too far off from where we were in 2008-2009. So kind of coming into this, um, for most all of these, these crops, I have cotton down here, um, which there's a very different story, but there's also a different session for cotton, so I won't talk about that. Um, so just we, we look at wheat and what's going on there. I mentioned, uh, uh, I think this is fairly consistent with what uh, uh, Neil had just shown, the overall balance sheet for wheat. We, uh, in terms of U.S. farm prices, we saw um, a U.S. farm price for wheat. Again, understand that that has um, uh, also the softer wheats in there, so a somewhat lower price of $285 a ton in 2012-13, falling to $250 a ton. And that should fall a little bit more this year as we see a larger um, uh, production come online. The... If we look at, at exports, um, picking up on, these are just, uh, I, I think the striking thing here is if you look at the, the traditional suppliers of wheat to the world, that is the U.S., EU, uh, Canada, Australia, and, and um, Argentina, although Argentina probably deserves another 10 minutes uh, uh, just with the troubles they've had with uh, other policies that, uh, that have affected them, uh, macro policies and things like that. Um, the real growth here, though, has been in the, the former Soviet Union, that is the Black Sea region, uh, where we've seen um, them become very important suppliers of, of uh, wheat to the world. Uh, Neil mentioned coarse grains as well, but, but uh, in our projections, at least, they're, they're uh, accounting for almost uh, or over, well over 25 percent of trade uh, as we look out over the next 10 years. Again, the interesting thing there is because those are uh, is a much more highly variable region. Uh, the in, the the issue is well, what does this mean for price uh, volatility as we move forward? Um, rice, I won't say much about this uh, other than the fact that we again the story that we haven't really uh, uh, increased much in terms of overall ending stocks, largely because if you look at the consumption line there, it's just uh, gone lockstep with with production uh, over this past several years. Um, again, the world supply thing. I think the interesting thing here, of course, and, and it's, a, it's a fairly thinly traded mar uh, market, as many of you know, but the real growth has been, and projected growth is, is out of Thailand. Um, I mean, the U.S. Pr uh, provides a bit. We, we don't foresee much improvement or in terms of increase area, although we do see some uh, this, this coming year just because of the uh, relatively high rice prices relative to some of the other grains. Um, corn, of course, has been the big issue, and we did see this big snapback in production this year as the U.S. had a record crop, a uh, global record, as I said before. Brazil had a very large uh, crop and, and uh, a, lot, a lot of corn coming out of the Black Sea. Um, again, some rebuilding and ending stocks, which is, is uh, off of a very, very tight situation. And I think the, the uh, prices for corn have come down. Um, you know, almost uh, 40 some odd, 35 some odd percent this year, and we expect them to come down further, um, as we'll see in a minute when we look at the U.S. situation with plantings. Um, interesting, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about what happened in the U.S. in terms of ethanol production. Uh, understand that there's also still a lot of uh, that, that corn industrial use, which 
is more than just biofuels. That's also starch and other things. Um, China has been uh, has increased uh, uh, a lot there too. And, and while it's been flat in the U.S. Uh, over the last four years, it, it continues to grow. And again, a lot of this is starch production and other other um, uh, industrial uses for corn. But but you see uh, ever, elsewhere in the world that that's been relatively flat. Um, in terms of the projected coarse grain trade. Of course, most of this is corn. We are seeing some increases, um, pretty sizable increases over the next 10 years in corn trade uh, with fairly flat growth uh, for both barley and sorghum. I think the growth that we do see in barley has been mainly malting barley, uh, less, less feed um, grain barley. Uh, now, here I just show uh, uh, the, the countries that, that we're expecting imports to grow over the next 10 years. And I think the real dramatic one there is China, um, just again, is paralleling to a degree the growth that we see in, in soybean uh, imports with China. Um, as China brings more, uh, industrializes more of their livestock production, their poultry production, pork production, uh, they are moving more towards uh, uh, rationalized feed use. And because of that, they are they're meeting the protein needs mainly by importing, but we believe that over time they'll import more caloric um, uh, inputs as well. And, and we're expecting, we have begun to see that where uh, they are importing more corn, and we expect that to continue. Um, I, the U.S., I think, here remains a, a very competitive thing. Now, this looks like a huge growth. What, what I don't show you is the past where the U.S. was up in the, the 40, 45, 50 million um, a ton range before, uh, but we expect that to rebound over the next couple of years and and then see some growth there. Now, that said, we do see growth in, in South America, uh, but again, I think the U.S. Uh, will remain uh, uh, where, where crops like soybeans, we do see the, uh, the most of the growth occurring in the South America um, and Ukraine that apart from, uh, again, the, the Black Sea region, um, uh, Ukraine, Russia, uh, that, that we're, we are really, uh, we expect to regain a lot of that uh, exports largely because of the move, the flat growth now that we see in biofuel production. Um, soybeans, again, um, uh, uh, broken record, uh, uh, record production, record consumption, uh, some rebuilding in stocks there. Again, ending stocks here are a little misleading because you have about equal amount of ending stocks, uh, uh, you know, in the southern hemisphere as you do in the northern hemisphere. So a much more stable stock situation uh, than the seasonal pattern you would see for most of the other grains. Um, again, rebounding soybean prices fell as well, but not nearly as much as corn. And because of that, the soybean to corn uh, price ratio has remained very strong. Uh, typically, uh, or at least uh, for the southern hemisphere, that ratio, soybean prices is around three times that of corn, which is very much uh, in soybean favor. We saw a big increase in soybean production in uh, South America this year. Uh, and even with uh, uh, looking at, at for delivery in the, um, uh, in the fall, that is for the U.S., what, what U.S. producers would be looking at, we're looking at a price ratio of almost 2.5 to 1. So uh, very strong signals to plant more soybeans. And here, as I mentioned, uh, while the U.S. will remain competitive in soybean production, we just don't think I, with most of that growth is going to occur in South America. And, and again, some of the other, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we do see some of the Black Sea region doing that. But, but again, I think the U.S. to a degree is limited by area and, um, uh, uh, and is competing again with corn. So uh, we're a bit... Uh, where we do see the expansion capacity being in South America. Again, almost all of that, and this is, uh, this is phenomenal to me. Uh, if you were to go back and look over the last 10 years, you'd see this same trend that for the rest of the world has been essentially pretty flat, where we do see all the growth is coming in from China. And that, again, is expected to continue, although obviously down the road, if you look at countries like Indonesia, there's a lot of, of thought that they've two could become bigger um, uh, 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 importers of soybeans. But uh, for the time being, these are, uh, are uh, other, other large aging uh, economies that they could become potential markets. But for the time being, at least almost all the growth is seen here in China. 
Uh, so here, as I mentioned, uh, the U.S., a little bit of the, the increase foreseen over the next 10 years or so, but, but uh, most of that coming out of uh, um, uh, South America. Uh, we did put out our planning report, uh, report and um, you can see we, we are expecting a, uh, somewhat less corn being planted this year um, than last year, uh, and again, uh, it's largely because of the, uh, the fact that uh, soybean prices are that much more attractive uh, relative to corn, so we do see um, uh, 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 the, the, you know, I think there's an error there in the soybean number uh, because we, we're seeing higher plantings. Um, that must be 32, uh, 32 6 or so. Um, we're, we're, we do see higher plantings of soybeans this year in 2014, uh, fewer plantings of corn. Um, Otherwise, a little bit down on wheat. Uh, uh, again, the big issue on wheat, as we'll, we'll see, um, will be, uh, uh, I, I'm going to have to swap out this table and get to a corrected table. This clearly isn't right. Just goes to show you, you should keep it in acres that I understand and try to make those conversions into hectare. I'm, I'm totally befuddled on what I, I did on that. So. Um, we are expecting some decrease in prices, however, and, and I think the big uh, drops that we see are, are going to be on in wheat and corn, um, some in soybeans as well. Rice prices have remained high, and I think, it, or at least, and these are U.S. rice prices, so um, those of you who follow the U.S. market know it's a little at odds with sometimes with the, what's going on in the rest of the world, so uh, Thai prices would look somewhat different here, but um, we do expect the... Um, uh, uh, wheat prices to, to or the, the grains prices to come down again this year. Um, but obviously there's, again, because stock levels are really tight, there's still a lot of volatility out there, any sort of production problems. You know, we're currently looking at the, our own drought in, uh, in the southern plains. Uh, we've had a, a pretty stiff winter, uh, as many of you know, um, so there, there's a lot of focus on if there's, uh, if, if there's uh, the wheat crop, uh, the fall planted wheat crop has seen any damage. We'll know a lot more in, in a few weeks as we begin to get our, our uh, crop conditions reports out. But, but again, it's just to say that, that I think the world market um, is still fairly tight and with a production shortfall somewhere. And that's, I'm sure that's part of the reason why you see uh, the, the futures markets get all interested in when you have political events in, in a major wheat um, exporting country that, that uh, uh, is just to say with tight socks you get a lot of volatility. Um, okay, well, I think I've gone over most of this, and so, uh, Chair, I think I'll uh, turn it back to you. It's just to say um, I think that, that after you know, a long period of, of high prices, we are seeing some price moderation, although as Neil pointed out, relative to longer term trends are still above that. And uh, as we look out, we certainly see, uh, at least in real terms, fairly flat prices. Um, uh, and again, longer term growth, I think, is, is going to be tied for in some of the agricultural markets to things that are probably outside of that altogether, like things like energy prices and other sorts of things. So with that, let me conclude. <laughs>